There's just something special about coming back to Monza. It's the Temple of Speed, and apparently an assortment of other drugs when you take one look at the Tafosi every year. The circuit has been resurfaced this year, giving the owners an opportunity to open up some of the corners to better aid side-by-side -side racing, and giving the drivers an opportunity to claim the circuit's been ruined and now has all the character of someone from the Acolyte. McLaren entered this one on a high, having utterly dominated Max Verstappen in his home turf at the Dutch Grand Prix, then proceeding to rattle 90% of his fan base on Twitter. Would Red Bull be able to mount a fight back in Italy though? Well, here's your reminder to like and subscribe if you enjoy. And with that, let's get into the comedy review. It's the Italian Grand Prix. You know, for just a week off, we have a hell of a lot of news to cover for this one. My own content comes first, as my video on Logan Sargent earlier in the week aged well for a grand total of four hours before the American was demoted to Logan Cannon Fodder. Sargent was dropped, not in favour of Liam Lawson, not in favour of Captain Crash a lot, not even Sebastian Vettel, which Sky Sports brought up for some reason. No, they've gone with Franco Colapinto. This has been both a strange and rather divisive move between the fans and the 15-year-old girls who think Mick will shag them if they creep out over him on social media. I'm all for Williams giving a junior a chance for once, but as I explained in my video slash rant on Tuesday night, I worry this could go very, very wrong very, very quickly. I mean, they said there's no pressure, and yet someone's already compared this guy to Lionel f***ing Messi, of all people. Moving on, and Ferrari have entered their second home race of the year, deciding that they're going to celebrate carbon fibre. Sure, even sending its two drivers to its factory to have a go at laying up some F1 parts for themselves. Given how little of this video involved the actual process, I'm just going to assume that it didn't go very well. But did anyone else spot Nikita Mazepin hiding out in the background, or am I just a huge racist against bold people? They of course teased a special merch drop and livery once again, prompting so many cool designs only to paint the numbers black, and overall put in so little effort, it makes Red Bull's livery updates look scandalous. I mean, our expectations were low, but holy f***. Last but not least, Alpine are in the news, which, once again, is rarely a good sign. Having decided to scrap its underperforming engine program, its facility, and I can't lie, I can't do a French accent, so very Chatillon, have gone on strike. Workers display banners adorned with slogans such as Save 50 Years of French Formula 1, which ironically they could have done if they'd stopped striking and just worked a little bit harder. I would get to FP1 around now, unfortunately someone's given Logan Sargent a new job as driver of the f***ing safety car. The Aston Martin was on its standard reconnaissance mission on Thursday when it lost the rear and piled into the barriers at Parabolica. I'll be honest, that wasn't on my bingo card for 2024, though neither was McLaren catching fire or Sargent out qualifying Perez four times in the opening 15 races. Actually, I can't lie, I thought it would be more than that. First practice would be an important session then, not only for the debuting Colapinto, but also for young Kimi Antonelli. The Italian was sat in George Russell's car for his first opportunity on an F1 race weekend, and he really made an impression into the barriers after about 12 minutes of running. It looked as if Kimi went out there all guns blazing, maybe a little too soon, setting some pretty decent pace before he decided to practice following the safety car, much to the delight of George Russell, who now wouldn't have a car for half of FP2. It appeared as if the parabolic of gravel was some sort of rite of passage when Colapinto went for a trip at the end of the opening practice hour. Probably not a good idea when team boss James Vowles has been busy violating half of the paddock in the media pen over the last few days. Seriously, so far he said he chose Franco because Mick Schumacher isn't special and also claimed it would be quote almost unfair to keep on Sargent and that he had quote reached the limit of what he was able to achieve. That even makes me want to throw myself off a bridge, I kind of feel bad for Logan now. Getting back to business and it would be Max Verstappen on top come the end of opening practice, though that didn't mean everything was plain sailing for the Dutchman. Struggling for pace at times, especially after he realised that while straight lining the first chicane can save you a lot of lap time, it isn't actually allowed. Red Bull's issues appeared to amplify in the afternoon, when both cars were unable to get themselves into the top 10. Though in fairness, this was a bit of a disrupted session after Haas forgot to tell Kevin Magnussen they didn't have to damage the team's assets anymore. Haas ended up escaping the Netherlands after all, having paid $9 million to that sponsor which apparently can never be named, though at least Hulkenberg was able to give the outfit some hope by ending the quality run 7th on the timing sheet. Elsewhere, Franco Colapinto murdered his first tyre while George Russell complained of finding a nut in his Mercedes cockpit. And I know Antonelli is technically 18 now, but I still don't feel comfortable making that joke. Teammate Lewis Hamilton at least appeared to refine the four mid-left in one of the refugee camps he visited on holiday as he 
return to the top of the times in FP2. Verstappen fans, meanwhile, were left hoping that FP1 was a genuine reflection of the field's pace, but given there was a Sauber in the top five, I wouldn't get your hopes up going into Saturday. The lead-up to qualifying brought the news that we were all expecting. Kimi Antonelli will be a Formula 1 driver with Mercedes in 2025. This was literally so obvious, headlines were using words such as finally here. Toto Wolff has now said that his mind was made up five minutes after Lewis Hamilton told him about his move to Ferrari, which calls into question the actual reason behind his summer dates with Max Verstappen. I wonder if Max was caught walking like this at any point in Zandvoort last weekend. Attention soon shifted onto FP3, however, Hamilton topping the session again, thanking the team by handing them his floor to repair after he murdered it on one of the curbs. Verstappen, meanwhile, was still struggling and failed to even make the top five. God, I hope Perez is using these tracks he's supposedly good at to find form again. Nope, never mind, he's driven the unstoppable RB20 to 18th. The session would be the first to avoid a stoppage, given Magnussen kindly waiting until after the checkered flag to pull over after the Lesbian 2. Let me know in the comments if you get that reference. Anyway, Lesbian 2 was catching a few drivers out, as Franco Colapinto tried out his qualifying lines to Little Avail. Meanwhile, Piastri was caught out trying to avoid Charles Leclerc. I'm sure the Aussie just missed the Ferrari. All of that new carbon fiber must have meant it blended in with the circuit. Honestly, this is the shittest special livery of all time, and I'm still not over it. Without further ado, on to qualifying then. And Monza has been seeing a lot of track improvement all weekend. That said, Magnussen and Colapinto were on a mission to negate this by decorating the circuit with whatever they could find in the gravel traps. Franco failed to make the cut in the end, qualifying P18, though credit where credit's due. We all know Logan would have turned this off into another album cover, don't we? Daniel Ricciardo just squeezed himself into the drop zone at the expense of his teammate Sonoda. Over the radio, he complained of there being, quote, shit everywhere. Not sure if he was referring to the gravel or what's left of Magnussen's F1 career. Q2 saw no real surprises. Lewis Hamilton had the pace throughout and could have saved himself a set of tyres by staying in the garage at the end of the session. Mercedes, however, pulled out their Bonotto signed strategy handbook and sent him out anyway. We might as well move on to Q3 in that case, and Max Verstappen's first lap was so bad he couldn't even beat Sergio Perez. McLaren and meanwhile were flying, Norris leading Piastri ahead of the two silver arrows. Checo's turn up of pace was rewarded by getting the privilege of being Verstappen's toe slave for the remainder of the session. For newer fans, Max hasn't got a foot fetish, at least as far as we're aware of. Instead, he'd have Perez giving him a slipstream for his final run, giving him enough of a pace advantage to usurp his teammates, and that was about it. The Ferraris had a last bit of pace to get ahead of Hamilton, but up front, there was no stopping Lando Norris, who came across for pole and still moaned over the team radio anyway. Statistically, the pole man at Monza has converted the win more often than at Monaco. That said, Lando Norris is shit at start, so let's get to Sunday and see what happens. Well, Sky Sports didn't look very confident of a good race. We've just had one Grand Prix of this McLaren domination era, and they're already talking about rain, even though it was clear skies and 33 degrees out there. The lights would go out, and Lando Norris would get a good start. George Russell might have done two, except he bottled it into turn one, making his low-drag Mercedes even more low-drag by tearing half of his front wing off. As for the McLarens, for the first time potentially ever, Lando Norris has kept his lead going into the first corner. Turn 4 was clearly too much of an ask, however, as Piastri decided to utterly send it into the second chicane, pushing Norris back to third. Further back, Daniel Ricciardo had made up a spot on the opening lap, only it took sending the Hulk to the multiverse to achieve that. Nico was clearly angered by the incident, running straight into the RB a few laps later at Turn 1. Only he got the wrong one and took out poor Yuki instead. That said, the midget didn't like his new upgrade package this weekend, so maybe Haas were just doing him a favour by destroying them. George Russell's day was getting worse. He'd just been passed by Sergio Perez and was now in the pits to finally replace that front wing. Further up the road, Lando Norris was looking to undercut Leclerc, crushing into the pit lane speed limit board, hoping that the stewards might just forget what it was. On the subject of forgetting, after Ferrari delivered a sublime strategy in Zanvor, their return to Monza revealed they'd lost the plot again. Leclerc was pitted onto an impossible run plan while also losing P2 to Norris. Still, could be worse, you could be a Daniel Ricciardo fan. The Honey Badger had already got a 5 second penalty for his role in the Hulkenberg drama on lap 1. When he were to serve said penalty, he got another one after his front mechanic fondled his car for some reason. George Russell's day then got even worse when he was overtaken by Perez yet again, the Mexican expressing his bemusement about being raced for position. In his defense, the idea of an overtake has been pretty alien to him recently. Meanwhile, Lando Norris's four-pack of bottle jobs continued after a mistake at turn four and a slow pit stop. I haven't checked Twitter, but I'm assuming it's full of Verstappen fans quoting things like, simply lovely and what a f***ing by now, both McLarens were going to the end. Only problem was, Ferrari were as well, and they'd forgotten about that second pit stop. 
Yeah, remember that run plan I called impossible earlier? Well, Charles Leclerc was now leading the Italian Grand Prix with it. Sainz was in second and soon dispatched by Piastri at Ascari. He was the easy target though. Leclerc was 12 seconds up the road and there were only seven laps left in the Grand Prix. Norris was by a few laps later and then all eyes were on the timing screens. Max Verstappen, meanwhile, had to check if the factory were awake or if they'd got their calendar wrong when it came to the timings of the summer break. At the front, Piastri was gaining, but it wouldn't be enough. And by some godforsaken miracle, Charles Leclerc came across the line on lap 53 to take the win for Ferrari, who proceeded to utterly lose their sh**. Well, that period of McLaren dominance sure has lasted a while. Fair play to the Scuderia on this one. I think we all thought that strategy was a callback to their 2020 season, but really, it was just a ruse. And with that, Ferrari also put themselves in touching distance of Red Bull and the constructors. Yeah, this battle is far from over. Let me know what you thought of the race down in the comments and on the poll over on my community page. And if you enjoyed the comedy review, be sure to drop it a like and get subscribed to the channel for coverage of the rest of the season. Uncensored version is out on Patreon. A big thank you to them for all of their support. I'll be back very soon with the IndyCar comedy review, but until then, have a good one.